Welcome back to Seaweed Brain, a Percy Jackson podcast. Today, we are diving back into the Wrath of the Triple Goddess. We are going to be doing chapters seven through nine today when everything goes wrong and we really are off to the races. We have a brand new special guest today. Stick around. Yay! Welcome back to Seaweed Brain, a Percy Jackson podcast live from spooky season. Today we have three heads. Today we are triple headed. And three chapters. And we are doing three chapters. Yes. This was a piece of feedback that we got. (laughs) Well, we were also like, oh, it's only doing two chapters at a time. It's not a lot. And then someone was like, wow, it's literally stupid that you're not doing three chapters at a time. (laughs) That's thematically appropriate. So So here here we we are. are. Three chapters to cover today. Our third head, our brand new guest is... First timer Camille, aka at Priscius <laughs> Jackson, you may know her from. Hi, Camille. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Um, we were just talking about how you are on Instagram and threads. That's where you run a Percy Jackson fan account, but you also used to be on Tumblr. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about your childhood oh experience <laughs> with Percy Jackson. Oh my God. So I was like, a little Logan Lerman stan, okay? So, like, 2009, they're like, <laughs> Logan yes. Lerman. I'm familiar with the breed. Okay? So, I'm 30 now. So, when I was 15... You were like, I love the movie Hoot. It, no, literally. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> so, I was obsessed. Hoot as the gateway into Percy Jackson. Literally. It's, it's the pipeline. So, I was like, I got to figure out what this is about. There was a teacher in my school... They were going through the lightning thief in her English class, but I was not in that class because suck fest, I guess. So I picked up the books on my own and just kind of like ripped through them. And I remember walking down the street to Barnes and Noble, like every time I'd finish one and my brother and I would walk home and we would read the chapter titles first and just like giggle about how silly they were. So I have like my first editions. They're all like crinkly and wonderful on my shelf back there. And then in book one, Clarice calls Percy Prissy. And I was like, oh, Prissy is Jackson. And that's how that was born as me as a 15 year old obsessed Mm -hmm. with Logan Lerman and Tumblr. So like if you Google Prissy is Jackson Tumblr, you will find like gifts and stuff that I made and like lots of content but i think it's like a food blog or something now i don't know how that happened but yeah i've kind of just like been married to that username ever since (laughs) so yeah yeah you've been married to that username for like the lifespan of walker scobell oh god (laughs) (laughs) i never thought about it that way that's terrifying (laughs) that's history Also, Camille, do you have any pets? I've realized this is an important question we should be asking, similar to how we were asking if people had siblings when we were covering the Kane Chronicles. Mm. Yes. (laughs) So I am an obsessive cat lady. So I have two cats. They're siblings. They're four years old. There's Amelia Mignonette Thermopolis Rinaldi, Princess of Genovia. And there's Lord Nicholas Devereux. Um, and then, Isn't it Princess of Genovia? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, Princess of Genovia. I also am like a sucker for a stray kitten. So right now I'm fostering three kittens. I've got Artemis and Achilles. And they are siblings I found in the bushes out by my office. And then I am watching someone's cat while they're out of the country. And her name is Houdini. (laughs) She's like seven weeks old, tiny black kitten. And I searched for her for 15 minutes earlier, could not find her. She was asleep on my pillowcase, which is black. And (laughs) she was watching me the whole time. She was doing magic. Yeah. She really just... just Poof, you know. <laughs> now when we post new episodes, I want to post pictures of our guests' pets. Mm-hmm. So please send me a photo of every single one of your cats. Of course. Of course. For the internet. Thank <laughs> you. To dive into chapters seven through nine today, Carter, where did we last leave off? I believe we last left off with Hecate about to leave. We've gotten all of our instructions. We've been toured around the house. We've seen Gail greasy farty girl demolishing the chicken mm. and now that we have everything we need Hecate's about to leave and we're about to settle into our, our pet setting routine by going for a walk yes we're gonna walk the pets for the first time it's our first walk <laughs> percy notes here that no matter the dog annabeth loved all of them the bigger and scarier the better which is not something we didn't necessarily know but this feels like the first time it has been canonically stated outright that annabeth is a dog girl 
we knew that she was good with Cerberus and whatnot. But I feel like after the scene in season one where we got to see Annabeth um, with the bouncy red ball and whatnot, that kind of solidified it in our consciousness. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That like yeah. it feels like more of a big deal now than it used to. I think actually yeah. in book one, I think it's one of the first moments that Percy really gets to see her like emotional, like vulnerable. Obviously they have moments throughout, but she has yeah. that moment with Cerberus and he realizes like, there's like pain here for her. Like she's hidden a lot of her childhood and she continues to do so and like slowly opens up. But I think that's kind of one of the first glimpses mm-hmm. of like, the pain in her childhood of like she didn't just lose like when she ran away she didn't just lose like her family and things like that she's like attached to the pets that she left behind you know yeah so we're gonna have a second chance at domestic pet life in this book oh so annabeth is walking hecuba and grover is going to walk gale Percy notes that Gail is farting, which must mean that she's bonding with Grover. And then we're going to go outside and go on a walk. I love that like they're walking out and Percy's like, is everybody ready? And they're like, yeah. And then he's the only one who's not ready. He has to like run back, lock the door because he's being screamed at that he forgot to lock the door. So it's very on (laughs) brand that he's like focused on everyone else. Like, is everybody ready? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, okay, I'm not. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's this whole very family dynamic situation in this book. At different times, the dynamic is shifting, but it really does feel like Percy, father, Annabeth, mother, Grover, child, and their two pets. <laughs> and this keeps coming back. Mm-hmm. This is a very Percy dad moment yeah. <laughs> in their domesticity. Running out to the minivan. Yes, exactly. Hecuba is like dragging Annabeth along, and Percy says that Annabeth's braids had come undone, like she had just been through a wind tunnel. And I know that everybody can have brains, <laughs> but I do feel like this is a special and important moment of highlighting Leah in our minds as Annabeth, as we know Rick was doing while writing. And I thought this was very special and important, personally. Yeah, he's definitely talking about her hair differently now than he used to, where, I don't know, I guess there were mentions of ponytails and stuff before, but it, it used to be a very, um, how would you say, color-centric, color-forward way of describing hair. There were also previously a lot of color forward ways of describing eyes, a lot of uh, facial feature descriptions that I think come from a very particular canon where um, certain things vary more than other things. And I think now we're seeing more descriptions yeah. that are, say, interested in different stylings of the hair as opposed to um, what color it is. I think it reflects that that difference, but also I think this is more interesting, frankly. I think this is better. Yeah. You know, um, your hair is blonde every day. Mm-hmm. Your hair can uh, be styled differently day to day. It's telling us something about what, what's happening right now. It's telling us something that is accessible to, to all people. Yes. Everyone has, has hair that can, can look different day to day when we do things to it. I think it's a more interesting thing to focus on. When Percy first goes to see Annabeth at school, there's no commentary that there may have typically been like, Annabeth's gray eyes were particularly gray and stormy today (laughs) as she was having a conversation with her friends while her eyes were gray and her hair was blonde. And instead it was like, she had on a jacket and also Doc Martens. And that's what I want to know. Yeah. It's telling us exactly like about where she's at, what she's trying to accomplish. Yeah. And the Doc Martens are coming back in this chapter because <laughs> she had, notably, brand new Doc Martens on the other day. And today, she has to take those brand new Doc Martens off. Brand new. Yeah. We all know what brand new Doc Martens means. Yeah. No, in my notes, I'm like, way to go, wise girl. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. She is walking through the streets of Manhattan in just socks because her new Doc Martens were giving her such terrible blisters on her feet. And that is powerful and important representation of girlhood, of making (laughs) mistakes, of being the child of Athena, and yet still having to learn certain life lessons. Yeah, being a little too committed to the new Doc Martens. Like you can't put on brand new Doc Martens for like several hours at a time. I think it's not the blisters, right? Like the brand new Doc Martens is like the ankles. You're you're gonna like chafe. Oh yeah. You need socks of an appropriate height. She needs one of her marshmallow pillows. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And you can only wear them for a couple hours at a time. Max. When you're breaking them in. When you're breaking them in, it's true. I'm just like imagining her like down the side while like squeak, 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 you know, just like the yeah. rigid leather. <laughs> mm-hmm. We are, as I believe we started to talk about last week, continuing on with the idea of, hmm, these animals used to be human women. Um, on page 56, Percy is thinking a lot about Mrs. O'Leary throughout this chapter. Um, particularly, he says that he realized Quote, I realize 
I'd never actually walked Mrs. O'Leary. We played together and romped around, but whenever we needed to travel, we did so through her shadow teleportation power, which made her a very handy friend. I wondered if Hecuba could do that, or if Hecate had taken away her power with a shadowectomy. Did anyone else read that and was like, oh no. Shadowectomy. That's so, like, clinical. I'm just imagining, like, a sterile room. Well, yeah, it begins to evoke the fact that that this is a human woman who <laughs> is maybe had her like womanhood and like identity as a human being stripped away from her. Yeah. Um, and that's all, that's the thread that we're following because then he goes on to say, what would Mrs. O'Leary think of Hecuba? Something told me they would not have a meat cute with Mrs. O'Leary. I'd never doubted she had the soul of a dog, an ancient giant supernatural dog from the underworld, but still a dog with Hecuba. Well, I tried not to look in her eyes for too long. When I did, I saw something worrisome, the echo of a human personality. My friend Hazel had told me that Gale and Hecuba were both human once, back in ancient times. I couldn't recall the details, but it was clear that even after thousands of years, Hecuba still had plots and schemes swirling around in her brain. I didn't know how to deal with that knowledge, other than to hold on tighter to her leash and hope that she didn't decide to assassinate me by running in front of the 101 bus. This is so disturbing. <laughs> Did this also disturb you both? Um... If you think about, like, one of those, like, memes of, like, a dog and they have, like, human eyes and you're like, oh, no. Like, there's a human in there. Like, it truly is terrifying to think about. Yes. Or, like, some dogs are so big, they look like humans in dog suits. Mm -hmm. Some of them probably are humans in dog suits. Carter, what? (laughs) Why would you say that? You're going to say Vigilant. What do you mean? It's not like there are no humans in dog suits. I'm terrified. In the world, you know? Like, I don't know. What? I'm just... Um... Carter, you're terrifying me right now. <laughs> Some of the human-sized dogs out there are humans in dog suits. <laughs> not all of them, but, like, you know, non-zero. Are you kidding me? Why would you say that to me? <laughs> this is disturbing. <sighs> I'm disturbed. But, yeah, I agree. So I particularly find this phenomenon with, like, genetically engineered Labradoodles. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where they look cute. They have human faces. I see. Where it's like they, they like, they're like one of their parents was like a different shape and had a job. And then they're still like, they're trapped in a different body with the psyche. Yeah. Like a hunting dog, but it's in, it's in a body that can't hunt. What? Hmm. I just feel like their eyes look like human eyes. Oh. 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 <laughs> You're talking about the like Australian shepherds and stuff that have the like <laughs> electric blue eyes that are really, really scary. Is that what we're alluding to? So that's another kind. That's, that's another, another kind, kind of that's human eye dog. <laughs> like, are we discussing Carter's nightmares right now? Like, what's I'm, happening? I, 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 I'm afraid of lots of different types of dogs, as you're maybe getting out of this conversation. And I'm also afraid of light colored eyes. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna sit like Let us this know in the, the comments <laughs> down below what dog you think is most human eyed. Tell us what dog you're most afraid of. <laughs> because there's a human soul trapped inside of it. I'm terrified of this situation. <laughs> I frequently see a dog and think that there's a human soul trapped inside of it. But this is particularly bad. And I love that Percy's like, hmm, don't really know what to do with that information. So (laughs) let's just move on. It's interesting because I literally, I had thought when we sat with that and he's just like, ah, I don't know what to think about that. It's kind of like showing his maturity in that he's not like going to spiral down this thought process like 12 year old Percy would do like he's able to just sit there and be like I don't know what to think about that that's super uncomfortable and it also just reminds me of in Chalice he has the conversation with Sally where Sally mentions that when something scared him he would just sit there until he understood it or it went away or it was something like that but I also just like was sitting here thinking about these women who have been turned into animals for the rest of time <laughs> and it's this terrible and i i just was sitting there and like in my head all of a sudden was hearing mad woman by taylor swift like women like hunting witches too that was like on repeat in my head as i thought about that <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i thought a lot about medusa and how in general percy has changed his perspective on certain versions of women that he has to encounter in the greek mythological world that he's in and also the way that we think about the world building and the lore differently now than we did like 20 books ago Mm. in the battle of the (laughs) labyrinth percy never would have been like hmm kelly's a cheerleader at my school is she taking classes where did she get the uniform from um what is she doing when she's (laughs) not a cheer you know like this is like we're thinking very specifically about the implications of how these people and these creatures appear in percy's life like we really know what yodora's tea is when she's at school she's at school and when she's not at school she's like in a puddle somewhere we know what she's up to at all times and the lore is very built out 
I just feel like that is, we're really being very specific right now. Like previously, Percy would have been like, oh, as we did previously with Hazel, like Hecuba used to be a woman. That's sad. But now we're going to like really investigate and mind this and be like, what are the implications of that? Yeah, I think that's right. It's it's partially a function of, of more developed world building now that we have so many books, but I think it is also maturity and a curiosity about people generally, but also specifically monsters and the context and internal lives and all of that that they have that we didn't have previously. There's a line that's coming up that I want to say it's in chapter eight where he says something like, oh, some some of his best friends are monsters. Yeah, some of my best friends are monsters. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is one of those insights that I think we're continuously learning and relearning, like arguably that is kind of the whole point of the Sea of Monsters. But it's also not something he probably would have said 10, 15 books ago. Yeah, if you know anything about me, it's that like I am the head cheerleader for the Luke Castellan Fight Club. Like I'm going to be here all day every day like and this and i'm gonna make it about luke but in this moment Mm -hmm. is this something that has come from the way that sally raised percy because one thing that we know about luke is that even after he was on the princess andromeda after he spends all this time with monsters we don't Mm -hmm. get to see him interact with other half-bloods much after he leaves even then when all of his time is spent with them he's disgusted by them He hates them. He doesn't want Kelly near him. He's grossed out. She's always flirting with him. He never, ever (laughs) allows them to be human in any way like Percy does. And that's part of why they're such good foils for each other is that Mm. we get to see just how different Percy is by comparing him to Luke. Because one of them was raised by the Olympians and in that world. And one of them wasn't. And so we can compare yeah. the two and just see how different they are and how they go down these different paths and how they think about people, you know, our monsters, people. Percy yeah. says, yeah. And Luke would be like, uh, no. Yeah. I've never thought about Luke's relationship with the monsters that he spends all his time around mm-hmm. that are like his lackeys as part of the army that he's raising. But also like exactly. it's important that he gets their vote because they are the army that he's raising. Like he needs to convince mm-hmm. them. I think we took a beat on the relationship with Kelly because, but I, that was also mm-hmm. very singular because she is playing in a whole bunch of gender and Toxic sexuality tropes, yeah. tropes that yeah. don't particularly apply to the say Lashagonian giants or what have you. <laughs> Yeah, um, you mean they're not in mini skirts? They could be. They very well could for be for now. Yeah, hey, 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 hey. Um. <laughs> yeah, did he describe the pants? Maybe they are. <laughs> Maybe they are. We'll find out. <laughs> but it's true. No, I, I don't. Th- I don't think we got that much texture around those relationships. He's not exactly yeah. chatting with them about um, sports team rooting interests or what have you. I have a feeling, yeah. though. Call this one of my first predictions for season two. I have a feeling that we are going to mm. see more of Charlie's Luke rallying the monsters together and trying to get their vote against the Olympians and four Kronos and trying to sympathize with them and say, hey, you have never been respected and you've never had power, neither have I, so let's get it together. And he is going to be more of a representative as opposed to just an overlord in the show. Some might say this is contractually required. I think there's a great opportunity with the who's the addition the other half blood that they've added what's the name of that character oh for season two well it's just i mean i think that people are maybe taking this character a little bit too seriously i think it's just probably somebody who has like three lines she has and a happens name. to be a demigod <laughs> she has a name but i think she probably like my here's my other yeah. prediction i think she has maybe three lines in one episode i don't think that she's <laughs> going to really you know be changing the plot or anything like that yeah i'm interested to see if she kind of does um help build that like vice president you know kind of like take that role Mm -hmm. other than i mean aside from chris i don't know we haven't really heard too much about like chris and the goings on plot wise but Mm -hmm. i'm Mm -hmm. interested to see like that as well Mm -hmm. well back to the walk do we have to mention the ghost child we have to talk about Chekhov's ghost child on bike and ghost glasses (laughs) typical g-c-o-b-g-g i just had to explain this concept to my sister great now you get to explain it to me what yeah i don't know (laughs) Have we have, have we formalized this this on the podcast? I genuinely don't know. I think that the way that we use it is different from Chekhov's intention. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that far afield. Chekhov's intention, Chekhov's idea was that if you bring a gun onto 
the stage in act one, the gun must fire before the end of the final act. That's the principle of his gun. His gun must be used if it appears. And generally, in the, the, the way that we would apply that to this context is you're not going to see the ghost child on a bicycle if that ghost child on a bicycle doesn't have a backstory and a thing to do and a mini or maxi quest to give our protagonist at some point. I don't know, man. Y'all sound like you've been to college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> English minor. Story logic that not everyone follows. Oh, no, you know what? (laughs) This is a fun fact that I have forgotten to tell you guys. I wrote my college entry essay on Percy's daddy issues, and I got into my top choice nursing school with it. Like your common app essay? Like your entry essay that you have to put with your application. It was about Percy's daddy issues. Wow. I was 17, like, let's go. (laughs) That's strong. That's a strong, bold choice that few would have the courage to make. Was it? Was there a lot of Luke Never involved in that? I must imagine. No, no. I think I think I resonated more with Luke as I got older mm-hmm. and started to like read it more and more and like go. I think if you read through just like once or a couple times, you'll be like, "Ugh, Luke sucks. This guy sucks." Right? But then you start to like really like. I think that that's the difference between like people who really really hate Luke or just don't care and people who really really love Luke as a character is that the people who love Luke I think we've gone really deep into it <laughs> and like dug into his motivations <laughs> and gone beyond the surface level of this is a middle grade book and kind of like I know Becky's talked before about like as you get older and you read them again you'll find something different and so I think that I definitely have had that yeah. experience. As I've gotten older, I've always found something different. And like, I'm, you know, 30 years old, I sit here and I cry. Or like our mutual friend, mm-hmm. Justin, I was rewatching the series yesterday and I paused and I ran to my phone and I was like, Justin, Justin, oh my God, I just noticed this thing. Like, I still get so excited about it because I still pick up on different things. Yeah. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. Wait, Carter, what was your common app essay about? Oh, I can't remember. That's so. That's probably such not something worth sharing with that's with the the broader internet. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> well, to go back to this idea of um, Chekhov's ghost child on bike and ghost glasses, <laughs> we know that this ghost child on bike and ghost glasses is going to go off at some point and be some kind of turning point for the plot. Probably at the end of the second act or at the start of the third act or something. But yes, Hecate is the goddess of ghosts as Percy notes and before we like quickly move on from this vision so I'm wondering when you see a Chekhov's ghost child on bike and ghost glasses what do you think is the theme that we're playing on here because ghosts are typically like unfinished business regret but like could be other things like what do ghosts represent to you in media usually I think those are right generally I think in this context I'm trying to put together a stronger mental model of how all of Hecate's jobs relate to each other because she has so many Mm -hmm. and it looks like you know we're trying to play both with ghosts and magic but also choices like she's the Mm three-headed goddess triple goddess she's representing the different pathways while simultaneously also being about illusion and reality warping And I feel like the intersection is something about, I I guess, the choices that people, like, like, wrong choices would would be what I'm assuming we're going to get out of the ghost child. Wrong choices of the past to regret. I like that. Camille, do you have anything to add there? I honestly kind of just like one of my favorite things about all of the Percy books is that at first read, you can just be like, ha ha, silly, goofy, Halloween, you know? And so then you can like <laughs> deeper. And I just had this like, ooh, spooky, you know, like this is something we usually get from Nico and Hazel. We don't get this from Percy. This is not mm-hmm. normal for him. And when Annabeth comes up behind him, it scares him. Yeah, it's October. Gen pop spooky this time. Yeah. You're right. If Nico was here standing right next to Percy in this moment, he would have pointed at that ghost child on bike and ghost glasses and been like, ah, yes. 
the regretful choices of your past and looked at Percy and been like, what are the regretful choices of your past and the people in your lives as pasts? And we could have been done with the book, but that's not, that's not the mode. <laughs> like Percy, is that your Cocoa Puff? Exactly. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Sun in the Star tie-in. I sense much Marco Shiro influence in this book. Mm. <laughs> anyway, we are back at the mansion to see the ghost child on bike and the ghost glasses. And we get back to like reheat their uh, Mexican food that they picked up earlier and set up camp in the living room because Hecate won't let them sleep in the beds. Um, and there's Annabeth is just like, ah, this is nice. Um, as everybody is lying on the floor of the living room. I thought, Carter, you might care to comment about having all of our friends on the floor of your living room this past weekend. Was it nice? They were actually not on the floor. No one was on the floor. We had enough <gasps> uh, pull-out Luxury. couch chaise room for everyone, even when it was the pre-airport. Everyone's loading up here so that they can get ferried over time of day. It is nice, though. I, I support um, overcrowding. I support overcrowding when it comes to cats. Mm. I'll wake up with four cats asleep on me and I'm like, oh God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we get some Seabree Brain mentions on page 59. We get some Supreme Lord of the Bathroom mentions. Like, let's not mess with the plumbing here, Percy Jackson. Season one callbacks. <laughs> Which we should mention is wrong. That's the reason why we're having all these conversations is this is like one of my favorite details of this section is the... um. Oh, God, I'm forgetting the name. Um, we just talked about this person, the artist who does the staircases that are go in all the different directions. Escher. Escher. The, we are getting Escher-esque bathrooms. I think that's the reason probably why we had to seed that. Even though Hannah, unfortunately, was wrong about that in the context of museum design, I, I think she was prudent to to remind our, our reading audience of Escher so that we have a context for a toilet being uh, on the ceiling. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I did not pick up on that. Speaking of the nuclear family dynamic that we are witnessing in this book, at the bottom of page 60, they're talking about the toilet still. Careful, Annabeth warned. She used a plunger to open the toilet lid. Steam billowed out. The water in the bowl bubbled like a stew pot. It's a boilet, I said. I grinned, pleased with myself. Hecuba growled. Apparently, she didn't appreciate my humor. Annabeth often told me I would make a great dad because I already had the right jokes. Stupid, corny, and stupid. Not Annabeth saying he would make a great dad. Is anybody like, okay. <laughs> Girl, let's let's focus on undergrad first. Let's let's <laughs> It's funny because it's the kind of thing I hear. I read that line directly in Rick's voice, which I shouldn't. Yeah. But I read that yes. directly in Rick's voice. It's Rick and Becky. Though. It was one of the it self insertier moments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I also had this moment of thinking because she says stupid twice. She was like, they're stupid, they're corny. And then she was like, oh my God, wait, what have I just stumbled myself What's the third into? Thing? And then she says stupid again. Yeah. She's flustered because she's just said something about stupid, him being a father. Corny, and now she's and like, third oh, thing. stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> As they're kind of laying down for bed, Grover passes out immediately. And then Percy has this interesting line where he's like, oh, great. So Grover's asleep. Um, I hope this might give you some time to talk to Annabeth to talk about the ghost child on the bike and the ghost glasses and all of that. And I wasn't sure if this was usual. Is it usual for Percy to wait for Grover to be asleep in order to talk? Or is it just usual that Grover usually is asleep? And then Annabeth and him have this time to talk, like, hence the the season one train scene or the book one zebra cart scene i think we know that grover needs a lot of sleep um <laughs> 10 but, hours a but night. I needs are like, like this framing is different and i think it is perhaps a very plausible offshoot of the path that we were on and of their their new relationship and of perhaps the year that they spent physically apart um they being like Grover was like not really around for the Argo 2 stuff. There are like a lot of notes of, of this coming through where there's also a moment uh, on the previous page where Percy is kind of paternalistically reminding Grover about the smoothie and Grover's getting mm -hmm. a little annoyed. But there, there's there's this tension there about what you were describing, this perhaps shifting relationship where um, Percy sees Grover less as a co-equal friend with a similar relationship that he has to Annabeth and more as someone who he is spending less time with in Annabeth and is not a liability, maybe a liability, someone with like weaknesses that he feels yeah. um, need to be remembered. Like it, I, I guess what we're getting out of, of this, this mention here is that he's not looking to Grover for 
advice, particularly about general matters. Mm. There are like things that are in Grover's wheelhouse that he'll talk to Grover about, animal stuff, nature stuff. But, but is that kind of I, like is that kind of like an indication of this like shift from twelve year old Percy and Annabeth to Percy and Annabeth being about to go to college and kind of settling yeah. into their, their semblance of like life partners. Yeah. It, it's like a yeah. building of in the most innocent way, intimacy. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. everybody else is asleep. I now have time with my person to debrief and and just, you know, everything out. And also, like, anybody with an anxious friend knows that's not really the person that you want to download to at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely is something that he gets to do with Annabeth. And I think there's also some of that on the Argo, too. You know, and just like seeing their relationship yeah. grow, they do tend to take or or the fire escape in Chalice. Yeah, they tend mm-hmm, to take mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. moments that they can get alone to process together. Yeah, even though this is the trio from the original series, and we are really thinking about this book in relation to season two of the series, which would season two of the TV show, which would be. Um, the original trio, it is important to remember that this book takes Mm -hmm. place after Heroes of Olympus when Percy and Annabeth were on their own in Tartarus and their relationship has developed to a very different place. Gone through the worst of the worst together. Yeah. Mm Yes. Which we do celebrate, but we also, I think, have to reasonably ask the question, are they, um, you know, slipping into a traditional relationship, nuclear family type of, of script? Perhaps so. Perhaps so. Is that not something that might be a little bit comfortable for Percy or fun for him to get to experience, though? Because he All didn't of them. come from that. And I don't, I mean, none, none of them did. None of them did. Yeah. So they're getting to experience this nuclear family that we're all like, oh, it's yeah. typical, but not for them. And I think this is sort of 99% of the time what happens when you have a three person friend group and two of them start dating. It becomes a nuclear <laughs> yeah. family dynamic where the third person just slots into like, I'm the <laughs> child now. The third person is either the child or the parent. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's mm-hmm. true. That's true. Mm-hmm. You could just be the parent of the two. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I also picked up on that I wanted to mention, and I sat there and I read it and then I read it again and then I read it again. And I was like, this is very British that she's out like a torch like a torch, like a flashlight. And then I was like, was that a mistake? And then I was like, no, it wasn't a mistake. She's out like a torch. What's, yeah. he, what's he telling us? She had like a torch because of the Hecate's torches, right? I thought that was very clever. <laughs> out like a light, out like a torch. Oh my God. <laughs> Chekhov's cross torches hanging above the living room. Exactly. <laughs> we need to be reminded of them. <laughs> and as they are falling asleep, we are going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for chapter eight. Before we dive back in, we have some brand new patrons that we need to thank this week. Talia, Elizabeth, Lanky Boy one Angelica, Katie, Annie is not cool, and Vic. Thank you so much for joining our Patreon. And as always, thank you to our sustaining members, Olympus, Izzy, James, Justin, and Dayton. You too can become a patron at patreon.com slash seaweedbrain. Okay, page 62, chapter 8, opens up with a beautiful description of their new sort of like co-parenting nuclear family schedule with taking care of their pets and really highlighting the importance of spending quality time with your friends, even if that quality time is just joining them to run errands, which is something that to me is the true marker of an adult friendship, especially in New York City. This is how I socialize most often. (laughs) Right before I left New York, I was like, Samantha, I need to go take all of my change that I've made in tips to the bank so they can give it back to me in cash. Will you come with me? And of course, Samantha was like, of course I will. Hot girls grocery shop at like 9 p.m. And I love my friends coming with me. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And as Percy says, I was just happy to spend extra time with her and Grover, even if it involved being dragged across town by our fuzzy new supernatural overlords. It felt good. Almost domestic. Just three besties and their magical rent pets enjoying life. He also <laughs> mentions having dog hair in his OJ and like pole cat butt in his cereal. Mm-hmm. And I just like put in the margins like as a cat mom, you just got to work around the butt sometimes. <laughs> sometimes the butt is just in the way. Uh-huh. <laughs> but in face. Percy does not really uh, respect the nuances of uh, Gail's species identity. 
<laughs> yeah, he's not always consistently referring to her as a, a mustelid, right? As a polecat, yeah, or a mustelid. He he frequently is using the the other mustelid species names interchangeably, which is like her whole thing, right? She she's not she's not into Mm-mm. that. She is, however, into drugstores. She loves to go to the drugstores when they go on walks. Quote, maybe she realized she needed some anti-gas medicine in the worst way. Or maybe Dwayne Reed was having a sale on chicken carcasses. And then she also starts attacking the Little Zeus Greek food cart. And we aren't really sure why, but maybe it's because there's chicken there. Maybe it's because it says Zeus and we all hate Zeus. But that's an interesting note. It's a Greek food cart also. Yes, it's a Greek food cart. (laughs) Interesting to note. I thought it was cute that she was going to the drugstores because she's like a sorceress a little sorceress a little pharmacist i too love walking to the cvs yeah, and feeling like a little really sorceress <laughs> when i pick up my ashwagandha gummy vitamins <laughs> <laughs> can we start calling pharmacists just like sorceress like hello sorceress can yeah. i have zoloft please? in her mind she's going to the apothecary <laughs> but in reality she's going to Dwayne reed <laughs> mm. and then they decide that they're going to leave grover at home alone while they go to school which of course maybe we all know that that's a bad idea but that's okay what other option do they have? They have to go to school. <laughs> we have this moment where they're saying goodbye, and then Beth gives Percy, quote, a big wet kiss. And I just thought it was like the funniest imagery mm-hmm. again of like, here are your parents, here's the child. And then they kiss him on either side of the face. Mm-hmm. And that was just like perfect, just like no notes. That's yeah. great. That's exactly what I expect from these three at this point. I was also thinking slobbery, like hellhound style kiss. So it's like a slurp, you know? kind of thing off the top of the head (laughs) slobbery strong mental image i thought i thought of it as just like a you know a big wet kiss big a big noisy Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. i was thinking like a cartoon dog licking the top of your head so your hair becomes pointy with saliva (laughs) (laughs) sorry hold on you're thinking about annabeth doing this to percy yeah in a cartoon way i'm both of them doing it to grover (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) Or, like, I think they do it to, like, I want to say it's, like, they're doing it to, like, Simba at the oh beginning of Lion King and, like, trying to smooth out the hair on the top of his head. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. 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 Anyway, we're back at school. Yodora is terrified of Hecate. We don't really fully know why yet. Maybe it's just because Hecate's scary. Um, there's a really cute section about Paul Blofus's homework advice to Percy, which I hope maybe ends up being, like, useful advice to some child who's reading this book. Um, tend to what is most important first. This was, this was sweet. Yeah, the genuine actual insert information and advice <laughs> from a teacher. We have like these panics and these adults give us this advice as children. And then now as like a grown up who works in IT, literally my tickets have priority like rankings on them. <laughs> you triage every day, you know? Mm-hmm. This is where we get the some of my best friends are monsters line. Mrs. O'Leary, Tyson, and then Camille, you added Ella. Ella. Yeah. I totally forgot about the harpy. The harpy. Yeah, yeah. That was a good one. Literally my note, because I was making like, I have sticky notes everywhere. I have so many of mm-hmm. them. And my note literally was like, Tyson, Mrs. O'Leary, Ella, who else? And then I looked at yours and it was like, Tyson, Mrs. O'Leary, who else? Who else? Yeah. <laughs> I still think this book has so many similar themes to House of Hades. And I wonder how much we have grown since House of Hades, because I know that Rick would never write a book where you're just kind of recycling the same project. Mm. So every time these kinds of statements come up about like monstrousness and like who we're friends with and who we consider, I'm trying to think like, hmm, are we showing growth from where we were at in House of Hades? I think so, so far. I think the answer is yes, that it's presented as relatively common. And it's not something that he's harping on. It's a throwaway line. I think it's reflecting, you know, that he is still living in a world that is structured by certain realities, but also has internalized to some degree this lesson about the illusory and misleading nature of those those categories. I find that like Rick continues to find ways that Percy humanizes monsters and then goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Like here's a monster out in the world. Here is a monster in Hades, here's a monster in Tartarus. Here's a monster who was considered a monster as a human and now is a literal monster. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's like really hammering down on this idea, give people a chance. Their circumstances, you know, all that is, it, it goes down from just being like, they look like a monster. They have done bad things. Their circumstances are bad. Are they bad too? 
which is a lot to learn by the time he turns 17. Gosh, give him a break. (laughs) To bring up season two again, Percy in the show is already so much more emotionally mature and like sensitive than I think Percy was in the books in book one. And I'm wondering how we will represent Percy's distaste for Tyson and how that will play out in the show with a version of Percy who I think is a lot more understanding. It'll be interesting. No matter what, it's going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's going to have to be ashamed of Tyson because that's the whole journey of the book. But yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that reads because he has so much more knowledge of Greek mythology in general. He could also just like struggle with that concept of being an only child. And now mm-hmm. I have to share my cabin. Like, no, you know, like there's barely <laughs> room in here for one bed. Look at all the waterscaping. Like, come on. I just don't want Annabeth to be the only one who is struggling with the fact that she doesn't like Tyson and doesn't know why. Because it's important for us to see the journey that we've seen over 20 books of Percy coming to understand his perspective and biases against monsters. Well, she knows why, though. Yeah, it's true. She does know why. We'll see. She knows why. It's just, yeah, it's just that Percy is like, I don't get it. And she is not willing to dive into that trauma yet, you know? Mm-hmm. And we did still, at the end of the day, kill Medusa. So there's plenty of of (laughs) to be had. She had time to prove herself. And you know what? She messed it up. So yeah, goodbye. (laughs) Rick drops some lore. He's like, oh, you think it's 2024 in real life? So now demigods are going to have to have cell phones? No, they still don't have cell phones. They will never have cell phones. They can't use cell phones. (laughs) This is important. We also find out it's harder to connect an iris message if you're like moving and people aren't still, which made me think of calling Luke from the zebra car, things breaking up. And that, I think I just liked that clarification of stuff that we had seen in the past. And another lore drop, we find out that Riptide can make glowing etch marks using the tip of the sword as a writing utensil, which is something that either only Riptide can do because Riptide moonlights as a pen or maybe other swords can do it and we don't know. We'll have to hear from the underground rep- weapons ring in order to find out about this. <laughs> um, but that's cool. I hope that that comes up again in the future. Maybe in the next book, it'll be like a way that they communicate. I think it would be cooler if it's just I want to know how... Yeah, I want to know how he figured out that mortals could see it. Like, was he like writing stuff and then being like, oh my god, do you see that? (laughs) Yeah. Like, or did he like draw something and was like, that's super cool. And then everybody ignored it. And he was like, no one's appreciating Mm -hmm. my super cool Minotaur art. What the heck? Maybe Sally you can't know? see it. <laughs> like, how does he come? But Sally can see through the mist. That's because I went through that thought process too. But he doesn't say people who can't see through the mist. He says mortals. Mm. But he's he mortal. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. If I'm getting into the semantics of it. Okay, but he says I'm no just... regular mortals. So I guess Sally isn't a regular mortal. Yeah. Paul. They tied it out on Paul. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's how they talk crap about Paul. Yes, yes. <laughs> when they're out shopping. Yeah. That shirt is hideous. <laughs> like, oh my God, he's playing this album again. Can we get some Thelonious Monk in the mix? Period. <laughs> Thelonious is just spelled wrong. So wrong. <laughs> yes, exactly. Percy, once he gets back to the mansion, Annabeth shows up as well. Turns out Grover never showed up to pick either of them up. It's time for Chekhov's strawberry milkshake. Very cinematic mm-hmm. moment of them both going. Grover at the same time and then running into the mansion. The mansion which has smoke billowing. It's a very prepared image. Window shattered. Chapter 9, the apocalypse smells like strawberries. Every time they mention the strawberry, my brain is like, the poison, the poison for Cusco. Cusco's poison. <laughs> I know that's not how it's described, but that's mm. how I'm imagining is like this little vial of like strawberry. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The ice cream. The strawberry ice cream. The strawberry rice cream from the kitchen that Hecate told us not to go into. <laughs> As Percy walks in, quote, somewhere under the wreckage of the front door, the animal headed knockers were moaning in pain. Since they were made of metal, I figured they could wait. The lines are so mysterious. Who do we care about and who don't we care about? We don't care about the enchanted door knockers experiencing pain. <laughs> I suppose they aren't monsters. But like now where's the line? It's a line of like if you have if you have a beating heart. Is it flesh? I'm like, yeah. hey man, if if Jack were down on the ground in pain, yeah. you know, would he help Jack? Poor animal headed knockers. No one's taking care of them. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, no one is, actually. 
Anyway, we, we wander in. Grover is gigantic. And there is pink goo everywhere. Um, but Annabeth notes very quickly, it smells like strawberries. Um, I think we can pretty qu- quickly put all the pieces together. Mm-hmm. Grover ate the mysterious ice cream mixture, turned gigantic. Percy kind of doesn't recognize him at first also because he's like so gigantic that there's no there's no face. He's like deformed. We're just recognizing shreds of his t-shirt from behind. And he he slowly over the course of the chapter is reverting back to his regular self, but not smoothly. It's not like his whole body is shrinking. I, I think it's worth mentioning it's like a hot air balloon. Like he belches. Mm. Percy's like, hit the deck! And he belches. And then he's mostly back to normal size except a couple parts are still not quite there (laughs) he needed to get some lactate when gail was running to the Dwayne reed because he is gassy from that strawberry ice cream he needs some hermes multivitamins Mm -hmm. this chapter is mostly interesting because percy is trying to deal with how he is going to communicate with grover in the situation despite being extremely mad at him he's trying not to be mean he's trying not to yell but he is ultimately like really upset and also upset at himself for like not seeing that this might happen, but he wanted to give Grover the benefit of the doubt, but he shouldn't have. Annabeth is doing a better job. Yeah. He's wrestling with a lot. He's trying to be considerate of Grover's feelings, but then also internally trying to figure out how much it's fair to blame Grover for this. To what degree he feels like he can indulge or honor i guess his anger with grover which is his predominant feeling right now he's he's really angry and just trying to yeah. not communicate that because he doesn't think it he's trying to it. find out if what really matters is the blame somebody to blame then all right if that's the aim placing the blame give grover the blame just get him some lactate you know yeah wow that was a an excellent reference to that old queen Stephen sondheim <laughs> thank you <laughs> this also really shows growth from like the lightning thief to now and because like in the lightning thief there are moments where percy just says stuff and he hurts feelings mm-hmm. and he doesn't mean to and he has like as we see him grow we know from the very beginning he has so much patience and empathy for the people that he loves uh and so like think about um on on the bus coming home from Yancey. He says something to Grover that hurts his feelings. You know, he kind of like surprises him by saying, Oh, what about kindly ones and things like that. But he also says like you protecting me and he hurts his feelings because he just blurts. Mm -hmm. But then we get to a point where he's learned to like hold that back with the people that really matter to him. And then of course the very first time we see him meet Leo, They're on the Argo 2 above Camp Jupiter, Mm -hmm. and he's pissed. And Annabeth, like, physically holds him back. Mm -hmm. But also, he's never met Leo before, Mm -hmm. right? So he doesn't have that I care about your feelings thing. Mm -hmm. And it shows just how much of an empath Percy is that he can pick up on, like, okay, all right. I I have to take care of this person and their feelings right now. The fact that that like starts to come naturally Mm -hmm. to him i love that like i love seeing that growth in him yeah he doesn't say anything mean he he even says i was shaking with rage like thinking about all this stuff trying not to say anything but he's still Mm -hmm. visibly like from the outside shaking with rage annabeth sees that after gentle parenting grover and trying to like get him involved in the solution annabeth sees percy shaking with rage and is like how about you go take a walk because he, even though he has he is growing and yeah. the growth is not saying it out loud, he still needs to like go outside, cool down. We also haven't totally closed the loop on this. Like I would not call all of this behavior adaptive because he's in a place right now where he's not doing the worst thing, which would be just screaming. I've <laughs> because Percy, we we we've seen it over these past three chapters has been constantly reminding Grover about the danger <laughs> with the ice cream. He he's following up on this constantly and clearly does not fully trust Grover mm-hmm. on this. But we, we're we not at a point right now where we're closing the loop on that communication, where we're communicating any of our feelings or debriefing, decompressing about all of the disappointment and perhaps uh, failures of communication from a logistical and emotional perspective leading up to this point. At this point, it is 
damage control, which is okay, which is the way it's supposed to be. But I am curious to see how how we'll proceed from this point and how much of this we'll be able to resolve and how much of this is just going to boil. I, I guess like how how deeply this follow up conversation is going to involve going back through everything that we've already built up until this point in this relationship and how, how deep we will need to excavate to be able to get to a point where we can address all of the different ways in which we're not fully mm-hmm. communicating at this point. Erica, I think we could also like take that back to what you're saying about them like waiting for Grover to go to sleep before they talk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. You know, Percy's like, I'm worried about him. And I don't know that it's necessarily that he doesn't trust Grover. I think that Grover has done so much. But like in my notes here, I literally put, he's just a baby. Like he's probably by far the youngest on the Cloven Council, right? He's a baby compared to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so like maturity wise, I feel like he got to this point where Maybe other satyrs get to just like, ha ha, you know, like goof around or or they're just protectors, right? But he literally is the one satyr that came back from the search for Pan. Mm-hmm. And he's the one that found Pan. So I think that Percy definitely trusts him. But I also, there's something kind of like, what is it like reverting back to like kind of like being a child? Now the mm-hmm. stakes are lower, right? And he's just kind of like, you know having a silly goofy time and i think you know obviously percy has that moment of like oh i kind of want to talk to annabeth when he's not listening about how this makes me nervous you know Mm because they didn't know about this before they were all there together that the stakes were going to be like this so it's also so speaking of the family dynamic whether this is an experience of, of a child with two parents or a child with an older sibling and a single parent or two older siblings. I feel like this is a very familiar situation to me where the youngest person in the room makes a mistake. One of the older people in the room is going to be extremely understanding and try to diffuse the tension while the other older person in the room is extremely pissed and just needs to go outside and take a walk so that they don't make the situation <laughs> worse. Family Thanksgivings make so much more sense as you get older and you look back and you go, oh, okay, we're playing roles. <laughs> yeah, that's why that person left the room at that Kids, time. Kids, go take a walk. <laughs> get out. Mm-hmm. And uh, as Percy goes outside from this tense moment, we see Chekhov's ghost child on the bicycle with ghost glasses and start to hear the voice of Hecate. And this is where I really felt the echoes and the the sacred presence of Marco Shiro because this sort of like ethereal, like unexplained event of is Hecate watching him and therefore we're hearing her voice in his head? Or does it have something to do with this ghost child? Is she here? Is she not here? Completely unexplained and just going to move Mm -hmm. on. I don't feel like that's something that typically appears in a Riordan book, but it is very of the Oshirian style. (laughs) (laughs) The Oshirian style. I think that's right. Yeah. We're back in this world of Percy POV where like, we went to Heroes of Olympus and all these other wonderful things, and we got to hear all these other stories. And now we're back with the world's most unreliable narrator. And so I don't know if he's going crazy or if this really happened, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Unreliable narrator. Um, we get back inside. Grover is slowly falling asleep. Um, so it's time for Percy to call in some reinforcements. He's going to call Mrs. O'Leary. And that's where our chapters will end for today. Yay. So much emotional work. Oh, geez. Lots of emotional work in this book. I kind of feel like I've just done therapy a little bit. Okay, Camille, you're a first time guest here. And because we have Percy and Annabeth in Mm. this book, would you like to tell us whether or not you think Percy Beth is the greatest love story ever told? Oh, my God. I think for me, Percy Beth is like the blueprint I struggled so much in my childhood reading this book going, just kiss. Like, (laughs) as someone who was that age when I was reading it, I was like, you're so stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they've become like the blueprint because it was like the formative books. Like, I wasn't a Harry Potter kid, I was a Percy Jackson kid. And it was like formative, right? Bully each other, you know, take care of each other watch out for the other one while they're sleeping go do fun stuff together you know like Mm -hmm. trauma bond and also it 
was funny because I think Becky had said recently, somebody made a comment about how like we're so many years into this and they're still 17. And she was like, it is kind of silly, isn't it? Like at this point. (laughs) But there's something that's always been very comforting for me about Persebeth and just the fact that like they've always been there, you know? Yeah. I just love it. Yay. It's all true. (laughs) And how are you going to be honoring Hecate this Halloween? Do you have plans? Do you have costume ideas? Oh my god, no. I <laughs> I used to be like super big into cosplay. So I was like at conventions and all this kind of stuff. And I had like bespoke costumes that I would wear. And like for years in a row, I painted myself green and I was Elphaba. And I like <laughs> walked into... <laughs> I So I did like a semester of... Uh, really timely. I did a semester of nursing school and I walked into a lecture like green head to toe in a black dress and the professor screamed. And so like, (laughs) I feel like I've got all my spooks out. So I'm not much of a Halloween celebrator. I'm more of a homebody and I live in an apartment complex and people don't really trick or treat here. So I'm just going to hang out with my black cats. (laughs) Yay! That's plenty Very spooky. <laughs> Camille, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Also, by the time you're listening to this, we have one Agatha Online Patreon episode out and one coming. So go join our Patreon, patreon.com slash brain if you want to chit-chat about Agatha with us for spooky season. All right. We will see you guys next time. Bye! Yay! Bye, all. <laughs>